Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Japan and we're going to go to another brewery that I've never tried anything from before. So these guys are yet another relatively new addition to the Japanese beer scene. They've been very prolific in their short existence though and they've built up a very good reputation for the quality of their beers and for brewing lots of different styles. And they've also got a really cool kind of social enterprise behind them, this brewery. It's quite unique in that particular sense and you'll hear about that a little bit later on in the video but the beer itself is a style that I don't think you would find anywhere else other than Japan and that was the main reason that this one caught my eye as well as the fact that the brewery is actually quite local to where I am at the moment so uh, yeah needless to say I'm very curious to see what this beer is going to have in store for us hopefully it's another good one Hopefully it makes for an interesting review, and as always, I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. So, uh, yeah, for this review then, we are going to stick to Osaka, where I am in Japan just now. We're going to go to the south of the city, to Nishinari, and we're going to have a look at my first beer from Derailleur Brew Works, if I've pronounced that correctly. So, this particular beer is called Anonymous Brewholic Foundation. It comes in at 6.5% ABV, and this one is being described as a sake IPA. So yeah, they've added some koji rice into this one, which is the, the rice that you obviously use for brewing sake. I've had a, one or two IPAs with rice in them before, and all, they always have this lovely little oily mouthfeel to them uh, in the malty side of things. So like I say, this is one that just kind of caught my eye. The other reason, as you might know, if you've watched the channel for any length of time, is that I have filmed a number of sake reviews, and I love Japanese sake. So that was the main reason why this beer stood out to me out of the choice of uh, the Ryler ones that I had. This is yet another beer that I picked up at liquor shop Asahiya in Taishibashi Amaichi here in Osaka. A lovely little beer shop run by Koji and his daughter Rika based in Koji's grandfather's old soy sauce factory from what I understand. But uh, yeah, great selection of Japanese beers up there. Always new breweries to check out. He's got some really nice new world things. The US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand as well as uh, a bunch of more old school European, German and Belgian brews. So yeah, really nice beer shop and one that I would recommend you go and check out if you get the chance. But uh, yeah, I'll put the link to their Facebook page in the video description below so you can check them out. But let's crack on and see what this beer is going to have in store for us. So, as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that hopefully I can do in the future from Deraly or Brew Works. Very first time I'm trying one of their beers as I mentioned, but I'm sure it won't be the last. But there's all the usual social media down there as well. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support you give is massively appreciated. And remember, you can go into the channel homepage and search for beer based on the geography tagging system. So just go into the homepage, uh, use the search bar, put your hometown, state, county, whatever you like in there. If I've reviewed beers from the area you search for, they should pop up. Failing that though, you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries and you'll find this one in the Japanese playlist along with many other things. And you can also check out the uh, playlist of beers from other countries as well. But yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then and I'll tell you a wee bit about Derailleur Brew Works. So, Derailleur Brew Works, as I've mentioned to you already, are based in the Nishinari district in southern Osaka and the company was founded back in 2018 by Akinori Yamazaki. So, Nishinari is actually known to be a bit of a rough area in Osaka. After the Second World War, men flocked to the area in search of casual employment, you know, day jobs and things like this. And this trend actually continued until the Japanese economic bubble burst in the early 1990s. And as a result of that kind of economic decline that Japan's seen, a number of the area's residents these days are suffering from drug and alcohol issues as well as straight up disabilities. But the brewery itself actually evolved from a nursing home in the area called Cyclo who started a cafe. And one of the goals of this cafe was to help the aging day labourers swap their morning beer for a coffee and many would come into the cafe as well which was called um, Ravitalement if I'm pronouncing that correctly asking for help to find meaningful work but one of the one day you know they started employing some of these older day laborers in the cafe and some of the workers had actually been home brewers once upon a time which is technically illegal in Japan but this started off the idea of them founding their own brewery which they have obviously done but with a bank loan and some help from a sympathetic brewer, they produced their first batch of beer back in 2018, which was the Nishinari Riot Ale, an American Pale Ale. And the name of this beer is, of course, a nod to the large number of Western backpackers in the neighbourhood, as well as the street battles between 
uh, the day labourers, the Yakuza and the police that made the area a no-go zone in the early 1990s. Uh, but over the last wee while they've done a number of collaborations with breweries across Japan as well as internationally and today they employ over 70 people, the majority of whom have some kind of health issue like the ones we mentioned, uh, social or health issue I guess we should say, like the ones we mentioned earlier. But they're given on the job training and do all the tasks from brewing the beer to labelling and packaging and they opened their new brewery in Osaka in June of 2020. They've now got several tap rooms, I think they've got two here in Osaka one up in Kyoto and then another one down in Fukuoka and Kyushu and the name of the brewery, Derailer, is taken from uh, Akinori's love of cycling. The Derailer is the part of the, the bike that changes the gears. But as of April 2023, these guys have produced about 140 different kinds of beer according to Untapped and as I mentioned to you earlier, they do lots and lots of different styles. But uh, yeah, that is everything I can really tell you about Derailleur Brew Works for the moment. If you want to learn a little bit more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website, you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on, and you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So uh, yeah, let's go on and actually have a little look at the beer itself. So I'll let you have a wee look at the artwork then before we open up, and I have to say the artwork is lovely in this one. There you can see Anonymous Brewholic Foundation. 6.5% IPA this one. As we said earlier it contains uh, koji rice which is used to brew sake. Yellow koji rice to be specific and the hops in this one are Magnum and Elixir. So Magnum as we know is quite a popular bittering hop mainly from Germany but varieties of it are grown all over the place. Elixir is a hop I haven't come across all that often so I did a wee bit of research on this. This is a French hop from Alsace in the east of the country uh, it gives you between 5 and 7% alpha acid and it's supposed to give you a kind of cognac -y fruity note. That was the actual note that it said on the um, the website for purchasing this thing. So it says like notes of cognac and tobacco and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, pretty interesting I have to say. So 6.5% um, sake rice IPA this one. This should be really interesting. One thing to point out about these beers as well is that um, all of the different beers they do are, they have like a sort of comic book story kind of behind them. If you go on the website and look at the page for each individual beer, you'll see that there's a story there that talks about the uh, the beer, so it says, or that is attached to the, the particular beer and the artwork that's on it. So yeah, quite interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure that when I translated it, it's only in Japanese, so when I translate it into English it kind of makes sense, but not fully. I guess you have to go and read the whole series of them if you like. But uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty nice. 330 milliliter can this one. I believe this beer cost me about 700 Japanese yen, so that is somewhere in the region of, oh, I don't know, about £5.50 sterling, something like that. So about, yeah, maybe about six euros, uh, $6.50 American, something like that. But that gives you a rough idea of the price. Let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting then. Very curious to see what this beer is going to have in store for us. So let's do this and see what it's all about. That does look very nice. So, just put that down again so that my OCD is happy and we can actually take a look at the beer. So, uh, before the head disappears on this one, you can see that it's poured with about a half finger of a frothy, I would say kind of cream coloured head, that is just fading away to be a nice thin foamy layer and then round the edge of the glass you've got that big thicker ring to it. So yeah, kind of medium sized uh, bubbles in this one I would say. It's a little bit foamy there, you can see my nice Mino Monkey on the glass which is great. But yeah, in terms of the appearance of this beer, it looks a little bit more like a kind of West Coast IPA or something like that. You can see uh, little bits of particle floating around this one, which I'm guessing will be little bits of the, the rice. Um, but yeah, one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there. But colour wise I think it's fair to say that this one is quite a rich yellow uh, to be honest with you. And remember the colour of your beer depends on a few things. One, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise and thus you get a darker colour of beer. But any bad lation you do or adjuncts you put into the beer will affect the colour as well. But when it comes to IPAs, you don't often have to care about those latter two variables. That's quite uncommon. But uh, yeah, nice little bit of natural haze to this one. 
I don't think we really need to say anything more about the appearance of this beer. So let's have a wee look at the aroma and see what this one is all about. Oh, yeah. That's really interesting, actually. First impression of the uh, of this beer, yeah. I ha it reminds me of some of the old West Coast IPAs that I used to get from uh, Dugis Brewery in Gothenburg back in Sweden. It really has a little bit of that vibe to it. So, yeah, lovely oily malt base to it, nice kind of bright green component and also some oily fruity notes, actually. So, yeah, aroma-wise, this is pretty good, so it gets a thumbs up from me. Let's try and break that aroma down for you, though, and just describe it a wee bit more um, in depth. So... The backbone of this beer, you absolutely get a little bit of a kind of fresh, white bready bread crust. Yeah, so definitely white, fresh, white bready bread crust in there. And um, on top of that, you get a little bit of uh, you get a little. There's a little touch of an almost woody character to this beer as well. I have to say, a little bit of kind of Jacob's cream cracker type thing too. But then beyond that you have some fresh white bready character sitting in there and it feels like quite a dense but slightly sweet uh, white bread that's coming out of this one so that's definitely interesting but above that you can smell the uh, the koji rice in this one it's got a lovely kind of oily sweetness to it actually and you can smell the rice does have a wee bit of a kind of floral aromatic nature to it and you know when it comes to rice it's like anything else that you want to put in your beer like you know, uh, coffee beans. It depends the, the properties of the actual of the, of the actual rice flavour and things depend on a few things. It would depend on where it's grown, the soil profile and water profile of the area. It will depend on you know how the rice is treated after it's kind of harvested and things like that. You know, in sake they tend to mill the rice grain down so that uh, you get the good stuff, not the kind of more rough things around the edges. So you get the good part of the rice that's good for uh, brewing the sake with. Um, so yeah, and all the, and you've got different types of rice grain as well, actually. There's certain regions in Japan that are very, very famous for their rice. Um, so yeah, for me with this one, you can definitely smell the ricey character that the beer has. has a, it gives you a lovely oiliness, um, but the, the, the rice itself has a little bit of aromaticity within it. So you can kind of smell that in the top of the nose, actually, and that's quite interesting for me. And it builds a good bridge, actually, with the kind of hoppy side of the beer, too, in my opinion. So yeah, definitely like that about this one. So yeah, you've got that nice oily ricey character coming out of it. And above that, you have a little bit of a kind of oily biscuity character, like a McVitie's digestive biscuity sort of thing. So um, yeah, love that about this one. So nice, yeah, nice oily, nice sort of oily McVitie's digestive biscuit, you know, in there. A little bit of a kind of sweeter biscuit too. But yeah, the aroma... On the malty side of things and this one is really interesting. I like the oiliness of the rice. Um, but yeah, that's the thing that really stands out to me in this one. Uh, when it comes to the hoppy side of the beer, um, for this one, the green component is really nice. There's a little bit of earthiness in there. So yeah, there's a nice little bit of earthiness in there. A good little bit of herbal character. And then... Um, I would say there's a nice little bit of kind of, it's like a more oily floral note. There's a good little bit of grassy character in there as well. And um, yeah, I do like, I really like how that, how that goes together. Um, yeah. Green component in this one, as I say, the, the rice itself has a bit of aromaticity. Then you've got the aromaticity of the actual hops in there has got a little bit of noble character to it. You can smell the smooth earthiness and the little herbal character. So, um, yeah, I like that about this one. On the fruity side of things, then, um, for me, the fruity side of this beer, it's actually very sort of gooseberry and lychee-like. I think that's probably the best way to uh, to describe that. Yeah, gooseberry and sort of lychee uh, would be a good note to it. There's maybe a wee touch of like a sultana, you know, dry white green grape note in this one. But yeah, a lot of gooseberries for me, a little bit of lychee, and yeah, a wee bit of kind of oily sultana and stuff. I think that kind of summarises it, to be honest. There's maybe a little tiny bit of lime in there at the very front of the nose as well. 
So yeah, the that gets a big thumbs up from me. Actually, the way that this beer goes about its its business in the aroma, I should say, comes across very very well. Um, yeah, I think we can leave it at that for the aroma and go on to actually have a look at the taste of this beer. So um, yeah. Let's do this. Lovely smelling beer, this one. So this one, uh, as I always say, take a bit of time to just enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck in. But we're going to taste this one now and see what it's all about. So yeah, this is the Anonymous Brewholic Foundation, a 6.5% Saki IPA from Durago Brewworks in Nishinari in the south of Osaka. Let's get stuck in. Slanja, Skoll, cheers. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Um, it's quite straightforward and quite easy to drink, this one. Um, and it gives you, I think this one takes a wee bit of time just to just to open up and sort of show you um, all its flavour. But yeah, this is a lovely big kind of oily, gooseberry leaning beer, this one. Um, yeah, I'm guessing this one potentially isn't the most kind of bold and adventurous uh, beer that Derivia have done. But it certainly is very nice. I mean, I like things like this. You have to bear that in mind. I love Japanese sake and I love the more oily mouthfeels in these kind of beers. But if you like a good West Coast pale ale, um, a more oily West Coast pale ale, then this is one that probably will suit what you uh, suit what you enjoy. This is nice. And as I say, a little bit unusual, and that's what you want after 3,700 reviews. You want beers that are going to test your palate a little bit. So yeah, in terms of the... the we'll, we'll, we'll need to break this beer down and just describe it for you a wee bit more in depth, as we always do. So yeah, middle third of your palate with this beer then. You can feel the backbone of the beer. It has a lovely little bit of that kind of fresh, white bready bread crust there. Above that, you have a layer of kind of Jacob's Cream Cracker, and then toward the front of that, um, toward the front of that middle third of your palate, you do have a little touch of a, a kind of woody type note coming out of the beer. So yeah, fresh white bread, bread crust, a little bit of cracker, wee touch of a woody element there, and then above that, you start to get uh, the actual bready character from the beer. So you can feel with this one, it has a little bit of a, a kind of more dense white bready layer that sits on top of everything. So yeah, the... The dense white bread that's in there kind of gets more and more oily the further you go into the taste with this beer because you have the um, the, the sake rice just kind of sitting on top of that. So you've got that dense white bready character and the oily sake rice just kind of sitting on top of it. And you can feel the sake rice in the middle of that middle third of your palate. You can feel it's kind of oily and quite sweet. But then as you move further out toward the extremities of that middle third of your palate, you get a little bit more of a, um, you get a little bit more of the aromaticity out of it. So that's quite interesting too. So yeah, on the um, yeah, on top of that, you've got a nice little bit of. Um, Kind of sweetness coming out of the beer. So in the dead centre of your palate, you'll feel there's a little bit of an oily kind of yeah. There's a little bit of an, a more oily. I wouldn't call it caramel. It's like a very concentrated sweet McVitie's digestive biscuit sort of thing. It's kind of like the syrup that holds uh, the biscuit together. That's probably a good way to describe it actually. So yeah, you can feel that concentrated in the very centre of your palate, and as you go out toward the edges of the the palate with that one you feel you get more and more kind of biscuity character um, coming out of the beer. 
So yeah, the way that that all goes together I think is very, very nice. Yeah, flavour-wise, I think this beer uh, goes together really, really well. Uh, on the malty side of things, if you know, if you're going to have a sake IPA, I think it does kind of give you that. It gives you that lovely kind of sake, ricey sweetness in the middle, third of your palate for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's everything we need to say about that middle third of your palate. And the one thing I would say about it is that this beer kind of takes a little bit of time just to open up a wee bit. But yeah. Um, let's focus on the the back third of the palate then. So the border region between middle and back third of your palate, again, you get a nice little bit of bready build up in there and it's kind of like a fresh white bread and the base of that back third of your palate is a little bit more, that, yeah, the base of that back third of your palate, you've got a little bit more of a kind of grainy bready character coming out of this, out of this one, the, bre the bread crust. Um, as I've always said, for me, more dry and bitter flavours come out further back on the palate, whereas the sweeter flavours come out a bit further forward. So yeah, the bread crusty character is a little bit more grainy in this one. On top of that, you have definitely, uh, again, you've got a wee bit of the crackery note, which is still there. And um, above all of that, you've got the white bready note, which is definitely a lot taller and a lot more airy, I would say. So yeah. So, yeah, the way that, that, that the beer goes about from that perspective, I think, is, uh, is really, really nice. Um, on top, you can feel the rice kind of creeps over a little bit into the back third of the palate as well. You get more of a kind of aromatic-y type note on the back third of your palate as well from the ricey note, and that sits above the bread. And above everything else, you get a wee touch of the yeasty character out of the beer. And for me, it's like quite a dense... Um, and kind of woody crackery sort of brown bread that you get out of this one but you can definitely feel that on the back third of the palate the flavour is taller and then as you come further forward into the middle third of the palate um, it just kind of squashes down and condenses together so um, yeah the way the beer goes about in that sense is really quite nice um, yeah in terms of the yeah in terms of the hoppy side of the beer then, I think we can move on to that. Um, green component first. Back corners of the palate, you can feel a nice little bit of earthiness in there. As you move further forward, there's a wee touch of herbal character coming out of this one. So, um, yeah, and you can feel as you move further forward towards the front corners of your palate, you're getting more and more floral uh, notes out of this one. And round the front curve of the tongue, it's a wee bit lighter and more grassy, I would say. So, um, yeah. The way that it goes together is quite um, is quite nice. Um, I think for me, this one, it probably has a little bit of early edition hopping, a bit of late edition and a bit of dry hopping. So remember, um, this is assuming you have a 90 minute warp boil, of course, with time scales. Um, early edition hopping will take place within the first hour of the warp boil. That gives you mainly bitterness. Late edition hopping will uh, take place in the last half of the warp boil. That gives you a little bit of bitterness, but a good bit of flavour and aroma mainly. And then dry hopping, which takes place after the warp boil is complete, gives you only flavour and aroma. So, yeah, for me, I think this beer's got a little bit of all three in it. Um, you know, it's more common that West Coast IPAs use all three, which is why they're more bitter and they smell a bit deeper and danker. Whereas, um, yeah, whereas the... Um, I would say, yeah, the the you know the New England IPAs, brain's not working, just brain fart there. The New England IPAs tend to use the latter two, the late edition and dry hopping, and that's why their green component smells and tastes a little bit sort of brighter, actually. So, yeah. Flavour profile-wise on the green component is nice. You get a bit more zesty, grassy character out of this one the further into the aftertaste you go. But yeah, I do like how that um, how that goes together. So yeah, uh, in terms of the... Yeah, in terms of the malty, uh, the front third of your palate with this beer actually, you're still getting a little bit of malty character out of this. The border region between middle... between front and middle third of your palate, you get a little bit of bready build up in there. A wee bit of a kind of brown bready note. And the base of that... Um, 
yeah, the base of that um, front third of your palette, there's a wee bit of bread crust in there, a wee bit of white bread, and also a little bit of the oily sake character, but the, the, the sake rice feels a little bit smoother and sweeter, and then above that you get that nice oily bubble where the juicy fruity esters just roll their way out of the beer. And I would say the fruity side of this beer is kind of what we were expecting from the, the aroma. So for me, it's all, you're not really having to split it into the front and back half with this one. I mean, um, you can feel there's a little bit of a brighter, kind of, for me there's a lot of gooseberry in this beer. I do get the little bit of lychee as well. Uh, and I would say, I would maybe go as far as saying, there's maybe a, just when you reach the front tip of the tongue, it's almost a little bit more limey. It has that more kind of zesty, limey type character to it. So yeah, bit of lime, bit of lychee, bit of gooseberry. To be honest, I think that describes the fruity characters that you're getting on the front third of the, the palate quite well. So, um, yeah. The way this beer goes together in that sense is um, is really, really nice. For me, it gets a big thumbs up. Um, yeah, good stuff, actually. I mean, I, I like it. It's almost like, you know, Nelson's, it tastes a little bit like Nelson Sovine or Hallertau Blanc or maybe a wee bit, wee bit of Enigma or something like that, actually. If I was tasting this beer blind without knowing the hops, those would probably be my guesses. But yeah, nicely done beer, this one, I have to say. In terms of the flavour, I think that's everything we need to say. To round off the review then with a wee look at the mouthfeel, for me, this beer is, I would say it's pushing, it's mid-bodied, pushing toward the top end of mid-bodied. The carbonation is very smooth. You've got a nice oily mouthfeel to this one, I would say. It's quite an oily and slick beer, this one, generally speaking. Um, the malty base in this one has a little bit of dryness to it, but quite a bit of smoothness, a little bit of sweetness, and a little bit of oily character. In terms of IBUs, I think this one is probably about 40-ish IBUs. It could be 50, something like that. Always take my IBU counts with a pinch of salt. Um, that's, you know, that's my weakest point of beer reviewing. But yeah, there is a wee bit of bitterness to this one. And then the fruity character, as we said, is quite oily, but quite smooth at the same time. So um, yeah, nicely done beer, this one. I have to say that. Quite an interesting one. So maybe I need to try something a little bit more conventional from them. For the next review, but Koji seems to get the derailleur stuff in pretty uh, easily, and of course I can go and just check out one of their venues in the city at some stage as well. So we'll need to do that, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I think that's everything that we really need to say about this beer for this video. So we can leave it at that. Once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Derailleur Brew Works as well. And we will no doubt return to these guys again at some point fairly soon. But yeah, this was the Anonymous uh, Brewholic Foundation, a 6.5% Saki IPA from Derailleur Brew Works in Nishinari in Osaka here in Japan. So thank you again for watching. Check out my social media, check out theirs, and I will see you in the next review. Slanjit, Skull.